we have uh, quite a few people that watch us online. We thank you, those of you who are online. We certainly thank you for joining our Sabbath school class. And if you have questions or comments, go ahead and put it in the chat. We have our fine media team that's back there monitoring the chat. So if you have questions or comments, go ahead and put it in the chat and we'll, and we'll see them as well. We'll leave the attendance code up just for a few more minutes and then we'll move to the next screen. Everyone should be signed in by now. All right, I see Brother Sam is signed in. God bless you. All right. I think everybody is signed in by now, those of you who are at home. All right. And the next thing is September newsletter. Uh, this is a special edition. So that's the code for, this, for the newsletter. Many of you should have gotten a notification either in your email, if you registered for Sabbath School, or your, uh, it came to your phone. So hopefully you, well, this is a special edition of the newsletter. And some people, we're, we're featuring people. Did you know that this congregation has had six people in our congregation that has lived to be 100 years old? Let me say that again in English. We've had six people in our congregation that have lived to be 100 years old. Somebody ought to say amen. Six people. That's very unusual for, for, for one church. And now, presently, we have about six people that we know of that are in their 90s. Amen. And we actually have one present here that's in their 90s. Now, isn't that, isn't that a blessing? So God has been good to us. So that's a special edition that you want to... Um, those, of you who are, those of you who are at home, you want to scan that code and look at the newsletter. You want to archive that. All right, and go to the next slide, please. All right, the next slide. Now, this is the slide we were talking about. This is for the picnic, and we want you to scan that as well because we need to kind of get an estimate how many people from Longview are coming. I told you this is going to be a joint picnic with our sister churches, so... Please go ahead and scan that code, and they'll take you to a form, and so we can get an idea of how many people will be coming, and you can also order your T-shirts from that form as well. So we'll leave, leave that up for a few more minutes. For you. But we certainly want you to come to the, uh, to the Memphis Fun Fest. We're going to have a lot of fun. So we can, we can worship together, but we can have fun together too. Amen. All right, so we'll leave that up just for 15 more seconds. Then we'll go ahead and into our Sabbath school. One of our finest teachers will be teaching today, Brother Herbert Brown. He'll be for, he always facilitates a good lesson, and the lesson is good when you participate. So everybody get ready to participate. All right, let's say man as he's coming at this time. Y'all can do better than that. Let's say Amen. It's 12 noon. We're getting ready to start our Sabbath school lesson. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our Father, our Father, we thank you for the Sabbath day. We thank you for blessing and keeping us. We thank you for the excellent message we just received. Now, be with us as we study Sabbath school lesson. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. All right, we'll do like I did the last time. We're going to have the Sabbath school like. They go through the whole lesson in nine minutes. So we're going to do that now. On April 10, 1912, the Titanic, the largest ship ever built, set sail from the port of Southampton, England. It was her maiden voyage and had 2,223 people on board. The majestic and dazzling ship had a total cost of $7 million at the time, about $200 million today. It only had 20 lifeboats, but who cared? The Titanic was an unsinkable luxury liner. However, on the night of April 14th, a striking sound surprised them all. The Titanic had hit an iceberg, and then the unthinkable happened. The flawless ocean giant sank into the deep waters of the ocean. In Jesus' day, the temple in Jerusalem was considered an invulnerable structure. 
On the Tuesday before the crucifixion, at sunset, Jesus came out of the temple, and one of his disciples said to him, Master, see what stones and what building. He was right. Some of those stones weighed hundreds of tons, and their pillars were so imposing in diameter that it would take three men with arms outstretched and holding hands to span one of them. But Jesus replied that of that majestic structure, there would not be left one stone upon another. Sabbath School Like presents the series, The Book of Mark. Lesson 10, The Last Days. On leaving the temple, Jesus and his disciples went to the Mount of Olives, and the Master sat looking toward the temple. Then Peter, Andrew, James, and John came around. Do you remember what they asked him? Tell us when will that happen, and what will be the sign that everything is about to be fulfilled? Listen up. According to the disciples' reasoning, the destruction of the temple and the end of the world were to be one and the same event. But Jesus knew that they were two different and separate events. So in his answer, which is in Mark 13, he referred to all that his people would have to face from those days until his second coming. So this week's question is, what did Jesus warn his people about the different generations? First, the first generation. Do you know what a panoramic picture is? A photo where we can see the whole surroundings. Plus, it is taken with a wide-angle lens. That's right. Panorama comes from the Greek pan, meaning all, and orama, meaning view. The first thing Jesus does in verses 5 to 8 is to show us a panoramic picture of the future. False Christs, wars, earthquakes, famines, riots. These things would begin to happen in those days and would increase until the time of the end. That is, it extends to all generations of Christians from those days until the second coming. But from verse 9 on, Jesus changes the lens of the camera and shows three pictures of more specific moments in history. The first of these pictures could be titled, The First Generation of Christians. It was what most directly concerned the disciples. They would be persecuted, handed over to councils, scourged in the synagogues, brought before kings, betrayed by their family, and hated by all. All this because of the need to preach the gospel to all nations. But at verse 14, Jesus warns them about something unimaginable. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it does not belong, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. What was the master referring to? To something that the prophet Daniel had announced centuries before. The people of a prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. This prince, also called the Desolator in the same prophecy, refers to Roman general Titus, who in 70 AD led the destruction of Jerusalem, leaving not one stone upon another in the temple. But Jesus had given the sign to flee when they saw the abomination of desolation. A few years before the great destruction, when the Romans set pagan banners in Israel, the Christians remembered the Master's words and fled. And boy was it worth it, for they were saved from a destruction where more than a million people died. Did you notice? Jesus was saving future lives, three days before giving his own life on the cross. Second, to the following generations. Beginning in verse 19, Jesus shows a second picture focused on a great tribulation that his people would face at a time when the disciples would no longer be there. Those days will be days of tribulation such as never were since the beginning of the creation which God created. Even to this time, neither shall be. Listen up. Here, Jesus shifts his narrative to the future tense, thus pointing to events distant from his time. Do you remember that prophet Daniel also spoke of a great tribulation experienced by God's people in chapter 7 and 8 of his book? Yes, a religious political power would persecute God's people for a time, times, and half a time. That's right. This prophetic period of three and a half years, or 1260 days, is equivalent to 1260 literal years and extended from 538 AD to 1798 AD. During this period, the power symbolized in prophecy by a little horn persecuted and killed those who remained faithful to the word of God. That great tribulation would be so hard that the Lord said in verse 20 that if he had not shortened those days, no one would be saved. But for the sake of the ones he chose, he shortened those days. 
And so it was, the rise of the Protestant Reformation shortened that time of affliction for God's people. And Jesus also warned that generation that false Christs and false prophets would arise. It also happened, for the leaders of this persecuting power claimed to be the substitutes of Christ on earth. And under that premise, they demanded absolute obedience or death. But the true children of God were not deceived because Jesus warned them and in verse 21 told them, Do not believe them. Jesus was protecting his followers in future generations, three days away from being unprotected by the generation of the moment. And third, to the generations of the last days. The third picture is the one concerning the generations of the last days. After that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. The fulfillment of this prophecy occurred with three events that marked the beginning of the end time. The Dark Day. On May 19, 1780, an unusual darkening of the sky was observed for almost the entire day over a large section of North America. It was not an eclipse the dark moon. On the night of that same May 19th, the light of the moon was veiled as the sun had been during the day. The meteor shower on November 13th, 1833, there occurred what can undoubtedly be considered the largest meteor shower in history. What would happen after these phenomena? The second coming of Christ in the clouds with great power and glory. Exactly. And why hasn't he come? Listen up. When the Lord states in verse 30 that this generation will not pass away until all these things take place, he is referring to the first picture. The destruction of Jerusalem would occur in the days of the disciples. But when he says in verse 32 that of that day and hour no one knows, he is referring to the third picture, the day of his second coming. We do not know what day he will return, but we do know from the signs that it is near. Just before that, disciples showed the alleged glory of the temple to Jesus, and Jesus responded by saying that not one stone of the temple would be left upon another. A poor widow was dropping two small coins into the treasury. The rich had dropped in a lot more money, but Jesus said that she had given it all. That is what was expected of that generation. It is what Jesus expected of the following generations. And it is what Jesus expects of our generation. He gave everything for us. The disciples gave everything for him. Many Christians of past generations did the same. And we, who are part of the generations before his second coming, are also called to give everything for him. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. Sabbath School Like invites you to continue studying the series, The Book of Mark. Attention, all our followers. The materials from Sabbath School Like are being published alternately on our new channel, Sabbath School. All right, y'all get anything out of it? Amen. So y'all understand the abomination of desolation? Yes. Do y'all understand? Yes. All right, let's uh, read our memory text. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven. This week's lesson starts with a very brief story at the end of Mark 12, where Jesus make a profound statement about a small act by a widow. What was this talking about? They were in the temple, right? right? Jesus walked in the temple, and he went and sat over on the side where he could see the people uh, putting their offering in, right? That's right. So you had people doing what, Larry? They were put, putting their offering into, they putting their money into, into the uh, treasury, and uh, Jesus had to teach his disciples. Those that had, they gave of their abundance. They, he was looking at attitude, he was looking at purpose, and purpose of mind and attitude. And he, he, the reason why he's singing out the young lady, I mean the elder lady, she gave her her want, she gave her her need, but her attitude and motive was right to give into God's church or give into God's temple. Okay, how can you, okay, Jackie.
And if they were to look, if people were just to look at her, they would think that she didn't give anything, that she only gave two little mics. But he was making the point, as so often we do, men look on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Although it was two little small things, it was her everything. And as that uh, presentation just, just brought out, that the Lord gave everything for us when he died, that we have to give everything to, for him and to him. So that's the point of it about the two, the really two pennies, right? It, it's not all about the money. It's that we're supposed to give everything to Jesus, mm -hmm. right? All right. On that point, I got a, uh, something here, Marie, that says, some people hold back their tithes and offering when they think the money is being used incorrectly. We ever heard of that? Yep. All right. It said, this is a mistake. Individuals who do so miss the blessing. Religious leaders have a responsibility to use donations wisely and ethically. But even if they fall short to do so, God blesses those who give faithfully. Otherwise, our gifts would have strings attached and would not be free of our control. Second, everyone has a part to play in supporting the work of God, rich or poor. Some people think the poor should not be called upon to give offerings, and that they should be the recipients of the gifts. While giving to the poor is blessed by God, the poor themselves also have a role to play in supporting God's work. Did you all know that? Yep. That a lot of times we can help the people that's poor. Right? Right. How, how do we help them, Larry? One reason why we can help them. Most hinder, how do we hinder them? Huh? How do we hinder the poor by doing everything for them? How do we help them? Hinder. Hinder them. We never give them a chance to uh, get a job, go to work, get training skills. We don't want them to depend on the church. We don't want them to depend on people. They need, if they can, and able to learn how to work, how to make a living to be responsible because God worry let all of us know if a man don't work, he don't eat. Right. Okay. Uh, Monday's part talks about not one stone or another. In other words, Jesus, this was uh, the crucifixion week for Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so he came to the temple. Last week we discussed how the disciples thought he was getting ready to take over king of kings and get rid of all the all the riffraff, right? But they found out that wasn't why he was coming to Jerusalem. What was the reason he was coming to Jerusalem? For the crucifixion, right? Mm -hmm. So it says uh, they looked at the temple. They was talking about how, how fabulous and marvelous and how great it looked. And Jesus told them it won't be a stone stand upon the other one. What was that representing? that the temple would be destroyed, and they couldn't believe it, right? That's right. Just like they said, the twin towers were indivisible, that they couldn't be destroyed, but we see what happened to them. And so Jesus told them that, and a few of the disciples called Jesus to the side and asked them what did he mean by that? And what did he mean by telling one, one stone won't be turned from the other? What was the meaning? He talked to them concerning the future of Jerusalem, the future of the Jewish nation, and as well, the future of the world. Their time, all the way up into our time, but he did it prophetically. Right. All right, any comments on that? All right, we'll go to Tuesday's part, abomination of desolation. Those are some big words, right? Yeah. What they mean, Faith? Anyone? It meant the trouble of the land. Uh, first start with abomination. What abomination mean? Destruction. Okay. Something is going to happen. See, it, it began in Daniel's prophecy. Mm -hmm. It only be, it began in Daniel's prophecy concerning the time, if I'm not mistaken, what Jesus was talking about concerning it was going to happen uh, in Jesus' time after the resurrection during when the Romans took over the abomination, desolation, the trouble of the land, the trouble that's going to happen in Jerusalem, that's why he told his people 
at a particular time. When this comes, this is a sign for you to leave, but this is the sign for you to flee. Romans are going to take over. It's not going to be there for God's people. In our, in, in our time, uh, situations and circumstances as they are, when trouble in the land began to happen, one of the specific that things that we have to look to, when the Sunday blue laws pass, it won't be nothing left in this city for God's people. All right. We don't worship on a Sunday. We worship on a Sabbath. In time, the persecution will come to God's people. Brother Tate, there's nothing going to be left for us. All right. We won't be able to buy no sale. Okay, Jack, would you read this? The destructive hand. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. That's Mark 13, 14. Jesus linked the destruction of the temple with the prophecies of Daniel. The 70 week prophecy presented a prince, Rome, who would destroy the city and the temple after the death of the Messiah. Okay, Jesus linked the destruction of the temple with the prophecies of Daniel, Daniel 9, 27, and then Daniel 11, 31, then 12, 11. The 70 week prophecy presents a prince, Rome, who would destroy the city and the temple after the death of the Messiah. This is the des desolator who filled Jerusalem with abomination. Let me move up a little closer. I'll go have my glasses on. I got it. You got it? Okay, this is the uh, desol uh, desolator who filled Jerusalem with abomination, Daniel 9, 26 and 27. Luke makes it clear that the abomination of desolation refers to Jerusalem surrounded by Rome armies, Luke 21, 20. This occurred in 66 AC when uh, Cestus Gallus attempted to take Jerusalem. This unexpected retreat allowed the Christians to abandon the city and save their lives. And that's found in Mark 13, 15 through 18. A year later, Nero sent Ves, Ves, Pace, I can't pronounce it, Vespasian uh, to uh, quell the rebellion and he left Titus to continue the siege until the total destruction of the city in the year 70. Okay, when we were looking at the little, first little script, how many people died doing this? They said, how many people died? Over a million people died during this destructive hand. All right. And it questions on uh, abomination of desolation. Let's go back to this. It says, uh, reflection, just as Jesus predicted Jerusalem fell, how can we learn to trust in and the Bible in all its predictions? Anyone? How can we learn to trust the Bible? How we know the Bible is true? Not you, Larry. Not you, Larry. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, because uh, we can learn, <clears throat> excuse me, we can learn to trust him because the word of God tells us that heaven and earth shall pass away before one jot or one tittle of his word. You know, not until all his law has been fulfilled. And that's found in uh, Matthew uh, chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. And we have to remember that God is the same today. He's the same uh, tomorrow. And he's, he's the same always. You know, he never changes. So we can, we can put our trust, uh, trust in him. And uh, brother teacher, I just wanted to uh, comment on that last question that you asked concerning um, the abomination of desolation. Uh, the Spirit just brought it to me in a very simple way. He said, when this false system of religion joins hands with political powers, and we know who this false system of religion is, right? 
when this false system of religion joined hands with political powers, thinking they have uh, the God-given power to change times and laws, and, um, and a false day of worship, which is what you, we know what day that is, okay? Um, and we know that's the first day of the week, Sunday, like my brother said, that uh, Sunday blue law, when that is put into law. When that's put into law, the Word of God called that abominable. It's an abominable act against God, and this will eventually bring desolation, you know, to this earth. And uh, this is going to uh, leave man speechless. It's going to leave us speechless. Right. Back to when I asked, how do, we, how do we know that the Bible is true? We know the Bible is true because everything happened that the Bible prophesies. This stuff, a lot of this stuff is history. You can go to history book and see these dates, but you know the Bible was written way before we had history books, right? So you better trust in the Bible and the Bible alone, right? Stop listening to what men said because they said the closer we get to the end of time, you're going to have false prophets. Mm -hmm. And you won't know they are false prophets if you don't know what the word of God says. Amen. Go ahead, Jack. As you were saying, if you don't know what the true prophet is, you won't know the false one. But as Larry had brought up and Gwen had mentioned about uh, the Sunday blue law, does people know what happened in Memphis concerning the zoo? The what? The zoo, the Memphis Zoo. If you, if you look around now, you will see that a lot of stores are not taking cash. That's right. So the Memphis Zoo, it was a, 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 on the radio that the entry, they're going to stop taking cash. Now, it's one area there that they're still going to take cash, but they're going to stop taking cash. So it's the Sunday Blue Law, it's things pointing to that already. So don't look for the Sunday Blue Law to happen and think, you know, it's, it's upon us, it's coming upon us now when we look and see how things are uh, working out and setting the stage for that. All right. Uh, the great tribulation, because those who will be days of distress unequal from the beginning, when God created the world until now and never to be equal again. After explaining the destruction of the temple, Jesus began to talk about what happened, what would happen between that event and his second coming, a time of extreme tribulation. This tribulation is against the elect, that is, those who remain faithful to Jesus. The tribulation period involves the persecution of the faithful people by the religious power that dominated the Middle Ages. Who dominated the Middle Ages? What religious power? Rome. Rome, right. During that period, many paid with their lives for their desire to read the Bible and to be loyal to its teachings. Daniel 7, 25 and other passages tell us that the persecution would last 1,260 years between 538 and 1798. Before 1798, after Reformation, persecution subsided in some parts of Europe. Many had to flee their countries to take refuge in Germany or Switzerland in order to escape persecution. So what was happening between 538 and 1798? What was going on? Persecution, right? The Dark Ages, y'all heard the Dark Ages? So what was going on during the dark ages? They wouldn't let the people read their Bibles, right? And they were, they were slaughtering the Christians, those that wouldn't take, pay homage to what was going on. And then near the end, but right near 1798, what happened? What happened in 1798? You go. In 1798. Um, yeah, what happened? Uh, General Bertsonier, he was taken into uh, captivity. And uh, uh, General Bertsonier, excuse me, you know, captured the Pope. And the right. Pope was taken into captivity. And that uh, was that bruise, you know, to the, 
that daily wound to the head of the Pope. Right, right. Okay, reflection. At the time Jesus warned about false Christ, his movement had barely even begun, and yet he was able to make such an amazing prediction, which has come true. Even today, people claim to be Jesus. How should this prediction increase our trust in the word of God? You have to study his word. Amen. And when these people come to you and they're not speaking to the law and testimony, if it speaks not according to that, it's no truth in them, right? That's right. But we have a lot of people, people come to them with this and that, telling people, you ought to try this or try that, and the church is not right. What would you say to them? God said the church was going to stand, right? Amen. All right. In the comments? And then, Brother Herbert, just like we talked about it in church and schools and stuff, when it came to this particular general that captured the Pope, Napoleon gave that order. It's not like he wasn't in it nowhere. He gave the order. He was just as guilty as the general that he sent in there to capture the Pope. He was just as guilty of the Pope's death as the general was. He gave the order to capture him because all of them were uh, atheists. They didn't believe in God. All right. Go ahead. And, and also, uh, we have to remember that the coming of the Son of Man is not a secret rapture. You know, the Word of God tells us that every eye shall see him. You know, just as the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, right. hey, every eye will see him coming. So it's not going to be anything uh, secret about his coming. All right. Read Mark, let's tell us, read Mark 13, 24 through 32. I'm going to read that. Mark 13, 24 through 32. Mark 24, 13 through 20, 13, 24 through 32. It said, at that time after those horrible days end, the sun would be dark and the moon would be, not give light. The stars would fall from the sky and the powers of heaven would be shaken. This already happened, right? That's right. So what did this represent? When these three things happened, what did it represent? What did it represent? The end of time, right? When the temple and all the stones, that was, that was in the Old Testament, that happened, right? Mm -hmm. but when these uh, three things happened, the sun, moon, and stars, and all this stuff happened, that was what? Prophetic and pointing to the end. Right. Okay. In the verse 26, then everyone would see the Son of Man arrive on the clouds with great power and glory. And he would send forth his angels to gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest end of the earth and heaven. Now, learn a lesson from the fig tree. When it buds become tender and its leaves begin to sprout, you know without being told that some is near. That's right. Just so, when you see the events I've described beginning to happen, you can be sure that his return is very near, right at the door. Amen. I assure you, this generation will not pass from the scene until these events have taken place. Heaven and earth will disappear, but this is the most important part. Y'all read. Let's read it together. But Heaven Lord. and earth. Now go back. There you go. Heaven and earth shall, shall pass, pass away, away but my words shall, shall not, not pass, pass away. away. That's most important for us to remember. Amen. Because when the shaking comes, I heard a preacher say one time, you know, we have to leave our houses and run here, there, and everywhere, and you'd be wondering what's happening, and the Holy Spirit would be with you. If you read the Word of God, you'll know what's happening. He said, so what's going to happen to the one running and don't know what the Bible, what's going on? What's going to happen to them, Larry? They'll be lost. They'll be confused, and they'll get be caught up in things, and especially in the devil and his demon deceptions. Okay. Okay, let's go to verse 32. 
Let's read that together. But of that day and, but that, of that, hour, day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. What's that saying? Only God knows what. Larry? Well, oh. it's saying that only the Father knows, you know, the day and the hour that he's going to appear, you mm -hmm. know. But he has um, given us uh, signs of, you know, his soon coming. So that means that we have to, um, you know, take that knowledge and do what we're supposed to do with it. You know, prepare. Prepare for his uh, second coming. And then it told us that, you know, when we see this uh, desolation of abomination, you know, and we see, you know, this uh, 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 system, you know, stands up, you know, time is, is, it's time for us to start getting out of the cities, you know. And if those who are not able to get out of the cities, you know, God will take care of them. But those who can get out of cities, because we will not be able to buy nor sell. So if we get caught up in buying and selling, then we 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 are uh, taking on the image of who? You know. So we have mm -hmm. to uh, we have to do what you know. Thus says the Lord, and get out. You know, get out into the country so we can have farms and raise our foods and, and food and do whatever else you know that we need to do in order to you know get away from this. Uh, act of evil. All right. Jackie? Herb, but I have a question. But do we need to wait until the Sunday Blue Laws pass to g start preparing for this? Or do we need to start preparing now and listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit? One she second. Cause, she okay, start preparing saying? yesterday. <laughs> you can't wait to the end. We got to be studying like we're doing staff school now. Larry, take the brother tape. Uh, one, one, one second. Um, camp meeting two years ago, uh, can't think of this, Pollard, when he was doing the Sabbath school lesson, he was saying that people are saying it's time to go to the country. He said the Holy Spirit will let you know when it's time to move out of the cities. But if we believe the Holy Spirit and believe the Bible, we need to be preparing. We need to be getting rid of our debt. We need to be uh, downsizing our homes so we won't be like... Um, Lot's wife and not wanting to let these things go. As Herbert said, we should have started preparing yesterday. Amen. All right. But the Holy Spirit will be with us, right? That's right. And he will lead and guide us. Like Jack said, we got so many readings, so some white writings. There's no reason we shouldn't be prepared. When these things start happening, we should know our redemption draw at night. Brother Tate? Herbert, when I come in, in this church, it's 50 some years ago, we were having these classes getting out of the city. And we, I, even I and some of the other people that we went into the country to look over some stuff and we met with some people that were already living out there. Yeah, we are saying this, but are we trying to make preparation? The church, and the people in the church could come together and do some things to get some land because a lot of us can't afford to do, you know, one by, by themselves. But if, if, if we got together to do some things, that we could. But I'm just saying that what Sister Simon and Sister uh, uh, Jackie is saying is so, is so true. But we know it, but what are we doing about it? You see what I'm saying? Right. So the Holy Spirit has already shown us, the Holy Spirit has already come to each one of us, and we still sit, you know. So by the grace of God, I'm going to try to do something about it. Anyway. All right. right. We're going to end with this. Many things are happening in the world that are very disturbing. I'm sure we all agree with that, right? Amen. People truly are frightened about what is unfolding. How can we, as Seventh-day Adventists, with a kind of inside track on events, 
Use these things to point people to the hope we have in Jesus, the promise of his coming. We got to share our faith. We got to witness. We got to pray, study, and witness. That's right. That's right. All right. All right, Cloud. Well, we got <laughs> Bertils. I'm you gonna run back over there real quick. I see two hands, and then we go in. <laughs> Why y'all looking at my folks? We ending. <laughs> y'all. <laughs> we'll give him a little grace, Herbert. <laughs> Herb don't show no mercy. We give him a little grace. <laughs> Be obedient <laughs> unto death. <laughs> well, while these two comments are going, yeah, to those of you online, we, this is just what we do. We have fun in Sabbath school. <laughs> Amen. Sister Simon, then you jack, and then we go, then we go to an end. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to make a comment, you know, concerning, you know, these last days and getting out of the city. You know, maybe the whole church can't come together and do this, but uh, just, you know, uh, uh, personally, uh, being a Seventh-day Adventist Christian and understanding, you know, uh, what the Word of God is saying, you know, I have family that, I have some family that are Adventists and I have some that are not. But, you know, I can let my family know, and maybe if I can afford to get out and get to the country, then I warn my family they can come, you know, get a place large enough for others you know, we can't be selfish in this thing. We have to think of others. You know, maybe some families in the church, two families in the church could get together and buy some land and live, you know, get a place out in the country. But we've got to do what we've got to do. You know, there, there aren't going to be any excuses, you know, for doing what thus says the Lord. All right, Jack, you bring it on in. And I was going to say, and we have to live the life. When we live the life, and if someone is, is wanting to know something, the Lord will draw them to you. People watch us all the time, how we react to things, how we don't curse, and how we don't do this. So just uh, lift up Christ. We all, and me personally, need to be, uh, I do not need to bear false witness. If I'm saying I'm a Christian, I need to do what Christ uh, did and does. Thank you. All right, that's very good. I was going to throw a monkey wrench in about moving to the city, move to the country, but I'm going to leave that alone because <laughs> we'd be here for a while. So uh, I think somebody said just, I mean, some people will be able to do it, some people won't, but in all of this, we know that God will take care of us. I say in all of this, we know that God will take care of us. So that's, that's the main thing. And like I said, the Spirit will guide you into all truth. He will guide your steps. All right. I don't think how we have anything else. But go ahead and put one, one last time, gentlemen, if you can. Go ahead and put the, uh, but that's Sabbath school overtime. For those of you who are online, go ahead and get a screenshot of that. At around by 2 o'clock, we pick it up again, and we'll, we'll talk about country living and everything else <laughs> at that time. And also, go ahead and put the, put the next slide up. I don't have the, the clicker. Put the next slide up. Uh, that's our uh, young adults. Call that number of those who are at home and see if the young adults will be having uh, their Bible study this afternoon. So call that number and verify that. And then the next slide talks about a Bible study on Monday night. Uh, Dr. Fozier and Deacon Roger Rawls facilitate that. And so it's a very good Bible study. So that's the information on that. And Mon I think it starts at 630 on Monday Monday. Monday night, so avail yourself to that. Now, go all the way back if you can, gentlemen, and put the, uh, there you go, so they anticipate it. Again, for those of you who are here and those of you who are at home, and wait, just, just so happens. I know this is, this is bad. Just so happens I got, I, I have some t-shirts. This is going to be Longview's color. This is going to be our T-shirts, so make sure that you avail yourself to that. And each church is going to have a different T-shirt. It's going to say the same thing, but this is going to be our T-shirt. So make sure that you scan that code and get your T-shirts. And we're going to have a marvelous time at the Memphis SDA Fun Fest. I mean, we're going to have a marvelous time. It's going to be good. So get your T-shirts. This is our color. We're royal blue. We're royal. <laughs> Amen. Let's stand for benediction. Thank you so much for, for sharing. Brother Tibbs, you got a microphone? Could you close us out? Here we pray. 
Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the prayer and opportunity to pray that you have given us and making all things possible through your Son, our Savior. Thank you for the prayer and opportunity to be able to come into the presence of the holy and the mighty and the loving and the merciful and the kind and the understanding, God, as you are in your sanctuary. Have mercy upon us. Help us to continue to study your word, draw closer to you, Lord Jesus, that the power of the Holy Ghost teach us, guide us, direct us, and give us knowledge. Give us wisdom, but above all, give us an understanding. Help us to mature in the Lord as the power of the Holy Ghost make his word plain enough to us, simple enough to us, and easy enough for us to understand. Help us to continue to come to Sabbath school where we can be taught the word of God, where we can ask questions, where we can interject thoughts and talk to one another concerning the lesson concerning the great tribulation, concerning the second coming, concerning moving into the country or whatever the case may be, because there is a time of great tribulation coming upon your people. We do not want to get caught off God. Have mercy upon us, covered by the blood of your son. Remember every nation, kindred, race, family, tribe, tongue, and language upon earth. Remember all families here now in your presence this morning. Strengthen us, heal us, keep us, protect us, and save us. We're in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.